If you pay close attention and focus, by the end of this video, you'll have an amazing understanding of what PyTorch is, does, and how you can use it. Let's start with the intuition about how our brain seems to be somewhat related to this thing we call thinking or intelligence. Fun side note, I found this article that says that thousands of years ago, thinking was originally associated with the heart. Anyways, once we as humans honed in on the brain as being associated with the act of thinking, we proceeded to examine it, starting with simple probing and progressing into modern day techniques, such as observing the brain under a microscope. Supposedly, the people who have studied these images have picked up on the fact that there are many copies throughout of a specific type of cell structure that they've called a neuron. A typical neuron will be composed of two parts, the dendrite and the axon. The dendrite is where a neuron receives signals from its surroundings, and the axon is where a neuron releases signals into its surroundings. So the dendrite is sort of like the input into this thing we're calling a neuron, and the axon is sort of like the output. Focus. In math, there exists this thing called a function that oddly resembles a neuron. You'll typically see a function notated like this, f of x equals y. To connect these symbols in this thing we're calling a function, Back to the neuron it resembles, X represents the input into the neuron, F represents the neuron itself, and Y represents the output released by the neuron. In math, there is this notion of the composability of functions, or the fact that a function can be combined with another function to create a bigger function. It's like Legos. One Lego block can be combined with another Lego block to create a bigger Lego block. Now let's rewrite this mathematical representation of our artificial neuron like this. A of D of X equals Y. To connect these symbols back to the neuron it resembles, X represents the input into the neuron, or the dendrite. D represents the dendrite. A represents the axon. And Y represents the output released by the axon, or neuron. Let's take this one step further. Let's now replace D of X with the function MX plus B. And let's replace a of x with a function 1 over 1 plus e to the negative x. This linear function, that's what it's called, represents the dendrite processing the input received by the neuron. This sigmoid function, that's what it's called, represents the axon or output side of the neuron. This sigmoid function is cool because it always spits out a value between 0 and 1. If the sigmoid function spits out a value greater than or equal to 0 0.5, we interpret that to mean our neuron is firing a signal into its surroundings. If the sigmoid function spits out a value less than 0.5, we take that to mean our neuron is inactive or not responding to its input. Focus. This is what we'll use as the definition of our artificial neuron. 1 over 1 plus e to the negative mx plus b equals y. The individual who made the connection of using these simple math equations to represent a neuron was, I believe, Paul Werbos in 1974. But the individuals who popularized this idea were David Rummelhart, Jeffrey Hinton, and Ronald Williams in their 1986 article published in Nature magazine called Learning Representations by Backpropagating Errors. Let's now quickly implement one of these so-called artificial neurons in Python so you see how simple this all is. But hold up, before we continue, I wanna quickly shout out Andrew Ng. I got a lot of my understanding of the things I'm about to show you from his machine learning course on Coursera. The following sections were directly adapted and inspired by specific coding exercises in his course material. So all credits go to Andrew Ng and his team. We're going to be using Google Colab. It's a free and very simple tool, so don't worry if you're not familiar with it. All Colab allows you to do is write these little blocks of Python code, and you can run each block of Python code independently of the others in the file. The type of files that Colab works with are these .ipymb files, right? These Python notebook files. As I said, it's super simple. Don't worry about it. Here in this block, we specified our artificial neuron. This is how we can use this neuron. We can send inputs into it or input signals into it by changing this number here. We can run our neuron or execute this code by pressing this play button. You can see that when we feed in a value of one into our neuron, the neuron spits out a value of 0 0.5. You can see I've initialized the values of M and B to be zero. In practical terms, what this means is that the neuron is very trigger happy. It's always firing regardless of the input. You can see if I change this input to be two, it's still spitting out a value of 0 0.5. If we change the value of M to be one, this makes our neuron a little bit more discerning. If I now run this code, you can see the neuron is now spitting out more interesting values. Let me change this to be a value of, let's say negative two, and let's see what comes out, right? The value will change now that we've given M a value of one. 
This is how we interpret the values that get spit out by the neuron. If the neuron spits out a value greater than or equal to 0 0.5, we're going to interpret that to mean the neuron is firing. If the neuron spits out a value less than 0 0.5, we're going to take that to mean the neuron is inactive or not responding to our input. Now let's change some of the names of these variables or symbols in our code. Changing the name of something doesn't change the underlying thing. It's like a name or a nickname. Both someone's name and their nickname are valid ways of referring to them. We're going to rename X to be called input. We're going to rename M to be called weight. We're going to rename B to be called bias. And we're going to rename Y to be called output. Okay, so what can we even do with a neuron? It turns out a lot. For example, let's now train a neuron. This training example will be ridiculous, but I assure you, it's going to give you a great understanding of how we use a neuron. Here is a list of numbers from one to 10. And below this list of numbers, I'm specifying whether or not I think each number is cool or whack. A one means cool, zero means whack. The numbers I think are cool are one, two, four, five, and seven. Why do I think they're cool? I don't know, I just think they are. Machine learning, which is what we're doing, is really good at picking up on patterns that are very random or arbitrary, patterns that are difficult to pin down in simple rules. Here is a plot of these numbers. An X marks a cool number and an O marks a whack number. Let's now test our neuron to see how well it identifies this list of numbers as being either cool or whack according to our preferences. I've reset the weight and bias to zero and what we're going to do is run each number one by one through this neuron and see what it says. If the neuron spits out a value greater than or equal to 0 0.5. We're going to take that to mean the neuron is telling us this number is cool. I'm going to speed this part up to not waste time and we'll review the final results. As you can see, it's always spitting out that the number is cool. Remember, when we set the weight and bias to be zero, it makes our neuron trigger happy or respond to anything. As far as the results, this means that we're getting 50% accuracy because five out of the 10 numbers on our number line are marked as cool. So it's correctly guessing for half of them. Now what we're going to do is adjust the weight and the bias in order to see if we can get higher accuracy. We could adjust the weight and bias ourselves manually as we were before, but there is actually this really cool algorithm called backpropagation that will adjust the weight and bias for us or adjust the parameters for us. Let's run the backpropagation algorithm on our neuron and our data and see what happens. Backpropagation has finished, and this is what it's telling us. It's telling us that if we give the weight a value of negative 0.54 and the bias a value of 2.99, the neuron will match our data to the best of its abilities. The details of how backpropagation works are outside of the scope of this video. But as you can see, we don't have to understand how backpropagation works in order to use it. It's sort of like a car. You don't have to understand the underlying mechanics of how a car works in order to drive one. Okay. Now that we've trained our neuron, let's test our numbers out again to see if our accuracy is higher. I'm going to run through these 10 numbers quickly to not waste time, and then we'll review the final results. Here are the results after training. You can now see that we're getting 80% accuracy, whereas before we were getting 50% accuracy. Obviously, this is not great, but it's definitely better than 50%. To shed some light on what backpropagation is doing is it's attempting to adjust the sigmoid curve so that the curve gets as close as possible to all our data points. If we add up all the distances between the sigmoid curve and our points, we'll have a value that scores the accuracy of our neuron against our data in an unambiguous way. The lower the score, the better our neuron is matching our data. The technical name for this score is called the cost score. This chart on the right is showing the cost score of our neuron as backpropagation works its magic. And as you can see, Backpropagation has lowered our cost score from an initial value of, let's say, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, down to a value of about 0 0.5. Remember, the lower the cost score, the better, as it means our neuron is more closely matching our data. When you see this L shape on the plot of the cost score, or training curve, that's usually a good sign. For example, here's the paper that OpenAI published explaining how they built GPT-3. On page 31, you'll see the training curves they recorded as they trained GPT-3. Okay, now let's tie all this 
back to PyTorch. When you start chaining these artificial neurons together, they start to become capable of doing more interesting things. For example, now we're going to connect three neurons together to build a system that tells us whether or not somebody is an NBA player based on their weight and height. Generally speaking, we're gonna follow the same pattern as we did before. One, we're going to first initialize our neurons. Two, we are then going to test out our neurons to see how they behave before we train them. Three, we are then going to train them or run back propagation on them using our data. And then finally, four, we're going to test them again to see if they are better matching our data. Notice how we're now leveraging several PyTorch modules for building this collection of three neurons. When you start connecting artificial neurons in different combinations, you get what is called a neural network. Here's a diagram of our initial neural network, which was just a single neuron. It received one input, contained one neuron, and that neuron produced one output. And here's a diagram of our slightly more sophisticated neural network with three neurons. This neural network takes in two inputs, an individual's weight and height, that information is then passed into three separate neurons, and the output of these three neurons is then combined into a single final output that tells us whether or not this individual is an NBA player. Here is our NBA player detector neural network specified using the PyTorch API, and you can see here that we're initializing all of the parameters of this neural network to have values of zero. Now that we've initialized this neural network, let's test it out before we train it. Just as we did before, I'm going to speed this part up so we don't waste time, and then we'll review the results. Just as before, when we initialized the parameters of our neurons to have values of zero, it made them trigger happy, meaning that they would respond to any input. Here you can see, regardless of the individual's data that's being passed through the neural network, the neural network is outputting a value of 0 0.5, meaning it's always telling us this person is an NBA player. Now let's train our neural network on some data and afterwards retest these individuals to see what it's saying. Here is the weight and height data of the individuals we are going to use for training. I'm pretty sure you recognize some of these names. Here are the labels that tell us whether or not each individual is an NBA player. Let's now train our neural network on this data. You can see that as backpropagation progresses, or as training progresses, our cost is coming down. Let's now run those same individuals from before through our network and see what the neural network is saying about whether or not they are an NBA player. Here are the results of testing the same individuals from before on our neural network after it's been trained. The results are still quite bad, but you can see we have improved. We're up from 50% accuracy to 60% accuracy. You can see the non-NBA individuals are now being correctly labeled. And of the NBA players, you see that the only one whose weight and height strongly indicate them to be an NBA player would be Kevin Garnett. Okay, on the PyTorch.org docs, you'll see what I find to be the most concise definition of what PyTorch is. And now you have the background knowledge to appreciate what it means. PyTorch is an optimized tensor library for deep learning using GPUs and CPUs. A tensor is a fancy word for a list of numbers. If you look closely at our neural network, you'll see we defined our input data as a list of numbers. So PyTorch is designed for working with lists of numbers in the context of deep learning. When you create neural networks that have large amounts of neurons connected together, we're talking up to millions, billions, or more, the term machine learning gets rebranded into the term deep learning. In order to run the calculations for these large amounts of neurons, you need specialized hardware like GPUs. GPUs are special machines designed for running calculations on long lists of numbers in parallel. You can still run your PyTorch-based neural networks on CPUs, but if they're large, they'll likely run way too slow for any practical use case, as all the internal calculations will be done more so in sequence on a CPU. So now you know what PyTorch is. PyTorch is an optimized tensor library for deep learning using GPUs and CPUs. Welcome to PyTorch. Bonus section. This intro video wouldn't be complete if I just left you hanging like that. So in conclusion, let me give you three quick ways that you can get started using PyTorch in no order of importance. Option number one is going to be Google Colab. They have a free tier, a paid tier, and it requires no setup. If you wanna run your workloads on GPUs, here is how easy it is to access them. You go to this drop down right here, go to change runtime type, and you select one of the GPU options. It's that easy. You can copy paste in code that you find on tutorials, for example, on the pytorch.org website, or you can search the web for tutorials that pique your interest. Option number two is going to be Hugging Face. 
Hugging Face is an open source platform where PyTorch developers, as well as developers from other machine learning framework ecosystems, will publish their models for everybody to use for free. Most people are not going to be interested in building their own AI model, but they might be intrigued to see if the ecosystem provides a model they can use for their use case. If that's the case, you can come over to Hugging Face's website, search for models in the search bar right here. And once you find a model you're interested in, you can host it with just a few clicks and Hugging Face even gives you the Python code for you to copy into your projects so that you can connect your applications directly with the model. For option three, I was thinking of what I should suggest. I was thinking maybe I suggest you get a job at an AI company or go to an AI meetup or find a friend who likes AI so you can learn together. That's probably what I should suggest. But for completeness and to make sure I'm pushing the boundaries, what I'm going to suggest is that you buy your own GPU. This is the most technical approach to learn about this stuff, right? The reason why you're going to buy a GPU is so that you can run models on your own hardware. When you're looking for an NVIDIA chip, you're going to want to find one of their GeForce or consumer grade chips. Other NVIDIA chips are not going to make any sense for you to purchase. They only make sense for specialized facilities like data centers. So welcome to PyTorch. Enjoy PyTorch. Peace.